Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing super, super well. My name is Karan and today we're gonna to be talking about myasthenia gravis. So what is myasthenia gravis? So myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune condition and the autoimmune part of it is that you start generating antibodies to the nicotinic receptors. Now these nicotinic receptors are typically found on the postsynaptic neuron at the neuromuscular junction. And this is the junction between your lower motor neuron that's obviously coming from your spinal cord, supplying the skeletal muscle, the antibodies that are generated, and this is important for diagnostic purposes, are the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody and the anti-striated muscle antibody. Now, these are important because you can actually test for them, and about 85 to 90% of people with myasthenia gravis would have or will return a positive test result on this. Now, based on this information that I've basically said that you are attacking the antibodies, let's think about how this would present, right? So what's basically happening here is that your antibodies are going to go and attack and destroy these post-synaptic nicotinic receptors. What this means is that you are not going to be generating the same levels of responses, which means that even though you might have acetylcholine, it's not going to be producing the same effects. Also, we know that these receptors usually can be fatigable. Now, what I mean by fatigable is that it's hard for them to respond to multiple stimuli over and over again, which is why you have so many of them, so that when, while some get tired, the other can kind of pick up, the, pick up the load. And you can generate these constant contractions if needed. That is not gonna be possible here because you've destroyed a significant amount. So how will this present? Let's start with that. It's going to present with your typical lower motor neuron signs. This includes hypotonia, muscle wasting, weakness, as well as hyporeflexia. Now, myasthenia gravis is more common in women, as with most autoimmune conditions. But the interesting thing is it quite commonly presents with abnormalities in the thymus gland. Now, you know that the thymus gland has a role in the T-cell development, but the exact association between myasthenia gravis and the thymus isn't entirely understood. These abnormalities can either be a hyperplasia of the thymus, which is more common, and then you can also have a solitary mass called a thymoma. Now, this is important because most patients with myasthenia gravis often undergo a thymectomy. Obviously, if they, have a thymoma, if they have a thymoma, which is a mass, you want to remove that. However, even if they don't have the thymoma just yet, most patients with myasthenia gravis still have their thymus removed. Going back to our clinical presentation, one of the first manifestations of myasthenia gravis tends to be in the eyes, which is why it quite commonly presents with ptosis or diplopia, because you have weakness in the ocular muscles. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, why do the ocular muscles get affected first? Um, they definitely are not, do, are not doing the most, I guess, weightlifting, so to speak. Um, you have much bigger muscle groups that do that. But if you think about it, the eye muscles are one of the most active muscles in the body. Right? And myasthenia gravis isn't about kind of strength of contraction, but frequency of contraction and that fatigability that I talked about earlier. So with your ocular muscles, which are almost always moving, that's where you're gonna have your first presentation. And as you can imagine, if you have one side of the eye whose ocular muscles are fatiguing before the other, one eye is gonna lag behind or not be completely coordinated in its movements. And that's gonna present with ptosis or drooping or diplopia, because now the eyes aren't angled correctly, so you might have double vision. And although this starts at the eyes, it then progresses onto generalized weakness over around two years. And at this point, many patients might have difficulty standing up, walking, and that's when you have kind of muscle weakness everywhere else. The other important condition that I want to slightly talk about is Lambert-Eaton syndrome or Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Now, we talked about Lambert-Eaton a bit when we talked about paraneoplastic conditions associated with typically small cell lung cancers. And I talked a bit about how it too is an autoimmune condition that presents with weakness and affects the neuromuscular junction and muscle contraction. So how are the two different and what's going on there? 
I think this is an important one to know um, and can't come up on exams as well. So the two differences, firstly, what exactly is being targeted? So with, low, uh, with Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, you are affecting the calcium, uh, the voltage gated calcium channels, while as I mentioned, myasthenia gravis affects the acetylcholine receptors. And secondly, with Lambert Eaton, because the um, calcium channels are affected, over time, if you try generating enough responses and enough calcium channel fires, fire, you can still have high levels of strength, which is why with Lambert Eaton syndrome, strength or contractibility of the muscles improves with exercise temporarily before obviously dropping. However, with myasthenia gravis, it doesn't. With myasthenia gravis, the weakness is quite fatigable, which means the more you exercise, the worse it gets. And those would be one of the two big, the two big differences. In terms of investigations, I talked about how testing for antibodies is really, really important. And I think this is the one investigation you should never forget for myasthenia gravis if you suspect it. And the two antibodies, as I mentioned, are the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody and the anti-striated muscle antibody. And 85 to 90% of patients have a positive antibody test. It's imp also interesting how if the patient also has a thymoma, so if you have a patient with thymoma, thymomas who have myasthenia gravis, that number goes from 85 to 90 to almost 100% for antibody positivity. You can, also, you can also do electromyography studies to check for the contraction of the muscle because what it basically does is it stimulates the nerve and then checks for muscle contraction. Obviously, our issue is somewhere in between there at the neuromuscular junction. So EMG studies might help. And then lastly, because of that association with the thymus, we also might do a chest X-ray or a CT chest to look for a thymoma or a hyperplasia. In terms of our management, if we, so, so what we try to do with myasthenia gravis is if we know that we aren't generating a good enough response, we can't increase the number of receptors, but what we can increase is the amount of acetylcholine in that synapse. So we use an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So if you break down the enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine, we end up with more acetylcholine, right? And that increases its concentration and improves symptoms. And we can also do a thymomectomy. Um, and that's often done even if they don't have symptoms, uh, if, even if they don't have a thymoma. Mortality and prognosis is overall relatively good. Without treatment, it's about 30%. So mortality and with treatment is 5%. So that's relatively good. Um, and if you have myasthenia gravis purely with ocular involvement or ocular myasthenia gravis, that has a relatively good prognosis as well. One of the rare complications you need to worry about with myasthenia gravis is something called a myasthenic crisis, which is exactly what we've talked about with the basic fundamentals of the disease, but to a much higher level. So now you have even more weakness, even more kind of inability to contract. And one of the muscles that's always contracting is the diaphragm. So the key complication we worry about with a myasthenic crisis is respiratory failure. And we treat that with IVIGs because again, it's autoimmune mediated, plasma electrophoresis to help filter out those antibodies and early respiratory support. This can be either by um, close monitoring, early intubation, uh, um, early intubations as well as tracheostomies if nothing else helps. And that's all we had for myasthenia gravis. I hope that helped. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you guys may have. And as always, please look after yourself and please look after your loved ones.